honestly what I'm getting from this moment right now is classic fiction might just be books that are really heavy. So once, twice, three, five times a year, obeying some kind of logic which I'm not privy to but I'm sure exists and is arcane and weird and special. A major newspaper will publish a list of 50 to 75 to 100 to 32,000 books that you should read before you turn 30 or 50 or have kids or go to the grocery store or I don't know, do your nails. And those lists always get a lot of flack because those books are nearly always classics. And because people sort of resent the fact that we should only care, or we're told we should only care, about books that were published well before most of us even had teeth or lives. And on top of that, as someone who reads books pretty much all the time, I get a lot of questions from people asking which of the classics they should read, if they should read the classics, if it's a problem that they don't read the classics. So today in this video I thought I'd have a stab at asking the question about whether you should care about the classics. Before we go any further I just want to say this is a just my opinions and just like a product of my thinking and b I cannot possibly cover every single part of this topic. So if I miss something out and it's problematic that I've done so, please tell me because I want to learn. Uh, but if I miss something out which is just your opinion, please don't tell me. I'm okay. Thank you very much. So a sort of wider issue that we need to be aware of when we talk about classics is that all of the books that you would refer to as classics are also part of something wider known as the literary canon. Basically it's another word for classics, it's the books that we hold up to say this is reflective of a moment in time, whether that moment in time be actual time and things that were happening in the world, or whether that time be literary time and things that were happening in the way that people were approaching writing and reading. But the problems with the canon are many and manifest, and that is actually my very first lecture at university ever in my whole life was about this very problem. The most immediate problem with the canon is that it is almost exclusively white, middle class, male and straight. Which means that no matter what anyone tells you, or no matter what your personal understanding of history is, they are not the best at reflecting their moment in time because they reflect only the smallest fraction of an experience, the fraction of a period, the fraction of a society. Another problem is that we refer to the canon the same way we refer to the classics, in a way that assumes that it is a general thing, a thing that applies to absolutely everybody, every culture, every language, every nation, but that of course isn't true. People will try and tell you that there are literary canons that differ from country to country, and that is absolutely the truth, but the problem is, is that the way we speak and reflect upon canons often doesn't indicate that. So for example, when the canon was referred to during my university days, we never referred to the Scottish canon, the English canon, we referred to the canon. Even though not only was the canon we were studying not reflective of all novels written in the English language, it wasn't even really reflective of all novels written in Britain. It was overwhelmingly English and it was overwhelmingly from the south of England. I won't get sidetracked because this isn't a video about regional discrimination in Britain, but there must be videos about that and you should, you should watch some. And it's important that you know that the canon is so insufficient that there are multiple books considered to be part of the canon that were not successful or particularly impactful in their time, and there are multiple books that were successful in their time that are not considered part of the canon. The only way that a literary canon or literary classics could be useful to us were if we 
were to consider every single piece of written work ever. Not only is that not possible, that's fundamentally a thing that people aren't interested in doing. We can't possibly claim to have any idea of the development of writing or of reading unless we consider every single text because we just fundamentally have no idea what other people have read, what their influences were. If there are texts that were huge in their time that we've lost cultural awareness of that will have influenced novels that we do consider important. There will also be novels that were also obsolete in their time that we have even less cultural awareness of that will have had huge influence. But also, and this is my last point for this section of the video, it's completely arbitrary. What is considered good literature is enormously important to people. Not only because literature can shape society through the social awareness it can give us, or lack of social awareness it can give us through the way it can speak truth to power or very much not speak truth to power. It's also a really effective way of controlling society because if we say, oh, only a specific kind of literature is worthy and only the reading of a specific kind of literature makes you smart or well-educated or socially acceptable or have social currency, you can exclude vast amounts of people from having a seat at any table, and that's what we do already. The books that we consider hugely important, I keep using that word, are books that are pretty impenetrable to most people either because they use antiquated language or are dealing with antiquated concepts because you have to do other reading to really understand that one book or because they're simply unrelatable to us. The canon and what classics are considered to be classics is completely arbitrary and it's arbitrary for a reason. Those texts were chosen for a reason and sometimes that reason has been a natural organic thing probably I hope but often it hasn't often it's been done with intent and I would really like you to hold on to that if nothing else. So the second section of the video I would probably title how useful are the classics slash why you are reading. Because I feel like the answer of how much you should care about the classics could change depending on your answer to that question. For example, there is an argument to be made that say you wanted to write about or in a certain genre, it would be really helpful to have read the basic texts of those genres. So maybe if you wanted to write gothic fiction or horror fiction, it would be helpful to have re read Dracula. You should actually read Dracula, that's a good book. So that I'm kind of going to say three things. One, sure if you want, go ahead. Don't let me stop you. Uh, the second thing is, what is the second thing? The second thing is obviously there are far more genres and subgenres and sub 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 genres of fiction than are represented by our current notion of classics or of any any canon. For example, classic fantasy is very indicative of some contemporary fantasy, but more and more because more people are rightly being given voices and because language is a changeable living thing and literature is a changeable living thing and books are a changeable living thing things you know reading the basic texts is just not as useful as it probably used to be hi editing claire jumping in here just to say that the footage of my third point for this section got lost because i have a new camera that i'm still getting to grips to with but what i was going to say is that surely there's an argument to be made that if a classic has done the job that we're saying it has and we're saying that it has done, and if it has really influenced all the texts that have come after it, then is there a need for us to have read the original text? And I started off with the example of Dracula by Bram Stoker um, by saying that when I came to the text a couple of years ago, 
I knew far more about it than I had ever realised. And so you're about to pick up with me continuing on that point. And I was aware of it without knowing that I was. So if you're going to ask, do you need to read classic? If it's really a classic, maybe you shouldn't. And if you do, maybe this whole label is useless. Section three of the video is a very, very quick one, uh, but probably the most controversial, and that is the problematic author problem. The issue obviously being a lot of the writers of the classics were not good people. But I can really sum this one up with, I don't want to buy books from bad people who are alive and I don't know why that opinion of mine would change because those people are no longer with us. I fundamentally do believe that if people are known to have espoused really awful ideas, we should consider not teaching them in classrooms or in universities or putting them on lists of books you have to read before you are ever happy in life. And you're, people are going to come at me by saying, surely we should read them and we should teach them so that we can critique them. And you're at, you know what, you're absolutely, maybe you're onto something there. There is definitely a reality in which <laughs> we can read books by authors who are no longer with us, playwrights who are no longer with us, poets who are no longer with us, and say, the, the words are beautiful, but we need to look at them critically. But that isn't happening. Or at least if it's happening, it's not happening everywhere. Because the only part of this video where it's actually relevant that I have an MA in English Lit is that for four years of my life, I was the person sticking my hand up saying, cool, wasn't that guy a fascist? And if anyone knows me, I'm not the girl who sticks their hand up and says, cool, but wasn't that guy a fascist? Because I'm afraid of everybody. But it was in general me, and not only me, and I'm not saying that I'm so very special and you should stroke my hair, I'm just saying that I was there and it happened, I can provide you with references. Because, with some notable exceptions, we're not currently teaching people to be critical of the authors we read, we're only teaching them to be critical of the words. And I'm sorry, but if you write something beautiful or meaningful or whatever, but you were a fascist, or you were a racist, or you were a sexist, or you were a tough. I don't want to platform you. And I thoroughly do believe that people are complex and contain multitudes and make mistakes. As a white middle class person, I definitely don't think I'm the person who says, no, we should forgive these people and study them and give them value. That's not my call to make. And when there are, as there are, I guarantee there are, writers who uh, were great voices of change and compassion and social justice and liberty. When those voices exist, I don't think that we should be allowing too much of our attention to people who've taken just really phenomenal talent and not used it for good or who have used it for bad. And that applies as much to, I believe, writers of the classics as it does to writers of contemporary novels. The, geez, what are we on now? The fourth? The fifth? Is this a Leonard Cohen song? <laughs> so this last part of the video I would title, Conclusion, brackets. Are classics special? More brackets. Think of it like the Oscars. that throughout this video I might have given the impression that I don't like classic literature which actually couldn't be further from the truth. What bothers me is the idea that the classics or really any books at all are more special than others and that we should care more about them than others and that people who like them are more special than others and I've been trying to like think of a way of framing all of this and and the best one I've come up with is that we should think about 
classic literature, the way we think about the Oscars. The Oscars are like that. Sometimes, rarely, the film that wins really, really is the best that's on offer. But often that film wins because of a myriad of bad reasons and that film actually reflects poorly upon the people that chose it as the best film. And I think that classic literature should be considered that way. Sometimes books are classics that ought to be and ought to be put on that pedestal. The value of something lies in the beliefs and the leanings of the valuer. The issue with things like the Oscars or with classic literature is that is that the people who make the value judgments want you to think they know better than you do and they want you to think sometimes that they are better than you but they aren't. Anyone can make a value judgment upon anything. Classic literature is just literature. It is or isn't exactly what you decide it is or isn't. It is fundamentally up to you and anyone who ever tells you otherwise is wrong. So that's it from me. Thank you so much for watching this video. I've done my very best to kind of address what is a really difficult question, but I'm also going to link some resources by people who probably know way more than I do in the description so you can have a look at those. If you enjoyed this video, if you could give it a like or click subscribe, I post videos every Sunday about books and writing and reading. Look after yourselves, I'll see you soon.